All right, recording is rolling. It's Monday, uh, February 28th. Uh, so uh, we're doing a more SAT uh, practice and review. We're going to do this with the Kahoot. Right, this Kahoot that you guys are signing up for right now, uh, these are all from section three, uh, which is math questions that supposedly you can solve without a calculator. Uh, but I mean, you guys have calculators. It's going to be fun. Uh, also, uh, last week, uh, I know I had the Kahoot set up, and there were uh, a couple of balls that I didn't know to tell. Yeah, we were we were doing them. Uh, so one of those was I, I was trying to give you guys about a minute per question because that's actually what you get. Uh, but uh, these questions, most of them, I give you ninety seconds, right? so you have a little bit more time to think about them. But of course, on the real thing, a couple of days from now, you only get a little bit more than a minute per question, so I have to keep a pretty good pace. Okay. Uh, and then um, your uh, double check your, with your teachers. Make sure you know uh, where you're supposed to be. If um, well, that that packet's going around says if you're testing where you're supposed to be. But if you're not taking it, a couple of guys might not be. Then uh, make sure you know uh, in, in case your uh, teacher's classrooms get swapped out, uh, where you're supposed to go. Right now, I'm still going to be in my room, so you can still come here during uh, during your fourth period if you're uh, not taking it. All right, uh, you guys ready to get rolling on this thing? Oh, uh, yeah. What, what's the room? What's the room? Uh, this classroom is 3209. Yeah, 3209. All right. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. And, right. and here we go. You guys, you guys ready? Uh, first question. Uh, what's the solution to that system of equations? All right, so let me switch the screen over, show you guys what I can't remember with how I saw this thing. So we cannot flip over. All right, so they gave you the system of equations. Here, guys, here. They gave you the system of equations. Now, there's uh, more than one way to solve system of equations. Uh, last week, I remember I, I was using the process elimination uh, quite a bit. So let me try a substitution. That's the other main method of solving, right? Substitution. What I did, I'm going to take this bottom equation and rearrange it to get uh, one. So x in terms of y in this case, right? You could do it the other way. That does okay too. Right? Lots of ways to the answer. But if, I, if you add y over, you guys see it would be y minus two. Then take this expression for x and substitute it into this x. Go pop that in right there. Right, that's going to look like this. So here's 2x plus 3y. So 2x plus 3y. But instead of saying x, say, ah, say this right here. Why not say, right? That's all equal to negative 9. Distribute the 2, so that's 2y minus 4 plus 3y equals negative 9. A uh, couple of y terms, a couple of constants, shuffle things around. Uh, so add these together, get 5y. Add the 4 over, you get negative 5, right? Divide both sides by this coefficient. So, okay, so y is negative one. Okay, you guys got that? Right. Now that's one of the values. You still need x. And the fastest way I think to get there is just to plug the answer for y right here. Negative one minus two is negative three. So there you go. There's your coordinate. Right. Negative three, negative one, because it's x, y. Okay. Okay. So maybe you got there a different way, but uh, that's one way to do it. All right, flip back over. Share screen. 
right, yeah, and uh, you guys got that. So nice. At number two. Uh, ooh, what's the value of y over x? <laughs> All right, yeah, that's doing good. Right, flip over. Not sure. Okay, so this is the expression they gave you, uh, which um and then the actual question is, what is y over x? Now, there have been uh, quite a few questions the SAT have asked where there's like some expression you have to solve, like, like x plus y or y times x, in this case, y over x. Uh, but they usually, like, there's a definite answer for x and y, and then you just put those in and do their little, little operation. This is sort of an exception to that because this is actually a whole linear equation. There is no single x and y value. Uh, but what we can do is uh, say distribute this for, you can get x in terms of y, right? But th this would be a direct uh, uh, relationship uh, between x and y. Like, for example, y could be 250. That would make this whole side 1,000. Right? And then maybe the corresponding x value would be like negative 333, right? So to balance that out, so, so something like that, right? Uh, the, the question is, what is y over x? So eventually, you can rearrange it, and it could look like this. So that relationship would be true. y over x is always uh, negative 3 over 4. Uh, so again, like. For example, if, uh, if x was 1,000, then y could be negative 750. Okay. Just as one example. Those points. Number three. Ooh, good old geometry one. All right. You know what? what I forgot to mention was um, I, I, sw I swapped the blue and the yellow. So the uh, uh, option B and option C, because that makes it um, align a bit better with uh, how these answers are laid out. So uh, just in case that was uh, tripping you up. So voice box back in here. Oh. oh, 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 oh. All right, so geometry question with proportions. Um, remember one that was sort of like this uh, last week? Right. So they told you uh, isosceles triangle, which means that 
well, in this case, like these two sides would be equal to each other. That, that's what isosceles means, right? Is that two of the legs are the same, right? Uh, they also threw a bunch of right angles on here. Um, uh, first glance, I was thinking you could prove that maybe these two are right angles, but I'm not 100% sure on that, so scratch it out. But, but you can still solve the proportions on this, right? They did tell you that, um, so, so other details, the top side of this was equal to 64 units long, and the ratio of these two was a five to three ratio. This is five to three. Okay, that? Okay. Uh, so what can you do with this? Where can you go with this? Well, I'm thinking if, um, if that was a five to three ratio, that um, this, I mean, this side and this side would be the same as each other. So that's also three. Maybe this would be provable as a right angle. We have to think on that a little bit deeper though. Right. This would be five. So this is five, this is five, this is three, this is three, right? Uh, okay, so do you guys see that this whole thing is like eight units long? Right. No, actually, sorry, that, that's not exactly true. It's just uh, proportions. So that has, it, it's sort of disconnected from the 64. So 64 minutes is like 64 inches. Right. And the, then all these little numbers I'm writing are just like right, ratio numbers, like relating to each other. So one thing is that this little bit compared to this entire side is a five to eight ratio. You guys see that? This would be five to eight, right? And uh, think about uh, proportions of geometry. You can also show that this compared to this is also a five, sorry, did I say five to eight? I meant three to eight. This compared to this is a three to eight ratio. So this compared to this is also a three to eight ratio. You guys see that? Three to eight. Let me set that up. So SQ over 64 is a three to eight ratio, right? Solve for SQ, right? Well, cross multiply of 64, SQ is three eighths of 64. 64 over eight is eight times three is 24. So the answer should have been 24 units long. So SQ, this is actually 24 units long, okay? Kind of a shorthand version of that mocked up. Oh, share, share screen. All right. Number four. Uh, Buster estimates the expected profit in dollars from one week's operation of his family's chocolate covered banana stand using the expression four times B times D minus 200. Now remember that's supposed to re represent a profit, right? Hmm, do you guys take an economics class? Profit is revenue minus cost, right? Already I'm thinking that fits that format, right? Revenue minus cost. B is the number of bananas sold, right? D is the number of days that the bananas stand is open. Which of the following is the best interpretation of the number four in that expression? Hmm. Let's see, there will be four, uh, I'll, I'll just go over this one with you guys. There will be four chocolate covered bananas, what is them? Okay, chocolate bana covered bananas sold at the stand each day. No, that's already taken care of by B. Uh, the price of the banana increases by $4 every day. Um, no, that'd be like a changing price. I don't think I really spoke about. The number of customers will increase by, a okay. Yeah, so option D. Uh, okay, so I didn't get there in the reading, but I think uh, option D represented like $4 per banana. Right? $4 per banana times the number of bananas times the number of days, that would give you how much revenue you made during that week, right? Okay, subtract 200, maybe get to the profit. All right, so the price per banana. Number five, the number of Java Gems coffee stores that existed in 2003 is approximately half the number of additional stores that were added uh, in well, the decade after. If approximately 700 stores existed in 2003, and why stores were added in the following decade, which of the following equations is true? Okay. Uh, tell you what, I'll walk you guys through this one. Well, give you guys a few seconds first, think about it. All right, so maybe a couple ways to think about this. One way is you could solve for what is y and then just say which equation is consistent with that. I think if we start with 700 and then we uh, added on 
700 represents half the number that were later added. Isn't that later number like 1400? So it looks like option A. Now, the other way you can interpret option A is look, half the number that were added is equal to the original 700. Yeah, so, so the answer is A. Okay. Uh, might be one of those, you know, slow down, think about, you know, go back and double check your answer. Okay. Uh, way I like to do it personally is just solve it and see which equation would be uh, consistent with the answer. But number six, su Steam Supreme, a streaming movie, uh, movie service, charges a monthly fee of $7 for membership and $1.75 per movie stream. Another service, Download Empire, charges a monthly fee of $4 uh, for membership, but then $2.25 per movie stream. Okay, so smaller membership fee, but more per movie stream. Hmm, I'm thinking if you only watch one or two movies, probably better to do that one, but if you watch lots of movies, probably the first one. Okay. If M represents the number of movies streamed in a particular month, uh, what are all the values uh, of M for which Steam Supreme's total monthly charge is less than uh, Download Empire? Ooh, all right, so nobody got that, but the uh, the tipping point should have been six movies. So let me switch over and show you guys why it should have been six movies. Oh, oh sorry. Um, sorry, all right, here we go. All right, so uh, we've got this registration fee plus this, many dollars per movie times the number of movies. You guys see X represents the number of movies streamed right, uh, for the time period. Right, so this was one uh, model uh, from one company. And then this is model from the other company, this registration fee plus this much per movie. Ah, you guys see the trade-off? Like uh, the one on the right has a lower registration fee, but higher cost per movie. Right? So, so at some point there's a switchover and you're better off getting the first plan than the second plan. Hmm, I, I wonder where that would be. Well, let's just solve for X. And see, it's an inequality. So it's set up to solve for that exact thing. So I'm going to subtract four over seven minus four is three. And the other way, I'm going to subtract over $1.75. Uh, that looks like 50 cents, I think. 50 cents uh, difference. Multiply both sides by two to get rid of this coefficient or divide by 0.5 either way. Right? Six. Right. Uh, now, another uh, hint that the answer would have been at least something like this is that. Some of those answer choices uh, were showing like X to be between this number and this number. No, no, no. Uh, if, if it's two linear equations like this, there will be one tipping point, like one place where it tips over. Like if you graph these, uh, here, sketch up a graph real fast. X price, you know, pay cost, whatever. Like, there's one service fee that does like this, one service fee that does like this, and the number of movies that that the tipping point was 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 like six movies right here, six movies. Right? Uh, the only way it could be like, well, X is between this number and this number is if you had some kind of equation that was like maybe a parabola or curve somehow, or these lines crossed in more than one place. Uh, but in this case, there's just one tipping point. At number seven. Uh, okay, crazy formula models the productivity index uh, barrels per day um, of an oil well with a pressure differential of P minus P, a permeability K, a uh, pay zone thickness H, viscosity mu, and drainage factor D. Which of the following gives H in terms of all those other variables? Thank you. 
All right. You guys figure that out. So switch over and show you guys that one. Uh, this is this one of those problems that at a glance looks really big and complicated, but when you break it down into how you solve it, actually it's not that bad. Okay. So they, they gave you this, right? So difference in p's to the power of k over mu times d all times h. Right? Uh, this h is in the numerator. Okay. Uh, and they said solve for this h in terms of all the other variables. Okay. Well, do you guys know? Um, here, I started to solve it out here, but it didn't finish it. Okay. Do you guys know if you have, uh, uh, let's say, x is equal to a over b all times y and you have to solve for y in terms of everything else you can take this uh this coefficient a over b and flip and multiply it to the other side so you go b over a times x is equal to y and that's essentially what we're doing here uh, and this x would be implied to be in the numerator so b over a all times x over one right that's exactly what we're doing because here's like your x here's your y and here's your a over b so I'm going to take mu times d cross multiply up here. That's where I got mu times d times q. But I still need to take the difference of p's to the power of k and divide that down. So that'd be like p minus p all to the k. And that will isolate h. And that's the answer. That's the answer right there. So it was just basically this right here. Okay. Guys got that? Uh, S equals 110 plus 4C. That equation is used to model the relationship between number of scoops of ice cream S on a particular day, um, will be sold, and the, and the temperature in degrees Celsius. I'm just going to walk you guys through this one. Right, so I'll get this one right. Uh, according to the model, what is the meaning of four in that equation? Okay. Well, I'm, I might run through some example numbers. Like, what if it was zero degrees Celsius outside? Wouldn't you sell 110? Uh, scoops. And then what if it was one degree Celsius? Wouldn't you sell four more than that? And then I think every degree Celsius you bump up, don't you sell four more? And that's what we're looking for. So which answer choice says that? Option A, for every increase of one degree Celsius, four more scoops will be sold. Oh, that is it, isn't it? Right? Uh, you can also interpret that four as the slope of a line, right? Isn't it? Rise of a run of four. So every bump up of one degree Celsius can sell four more scoops. Right? That's what it looks like to me. Uh, I got some of the other ones. See if, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Right. You guys good with that? You guys be able to figure out something like that? Number nine. Uh, while saving money to pay for grad school, Stephen created a plan in which the amount of money he saves each month is increased by a constant amount. So he's saving, saving more, saving more and more. Uh, if his savings plan says $145 during month three and 280 during month 12, then which of the following describes the money he will save, um, how, how much that changes uh, between month three and month 12? How much does that increase every month? Okay, it should have been a $15 increase every month. And I'll show you guys why. Why was it $15? All right, so uh, in month three, you saved $145, and in month 12, you saved $280. Hey, is that kind of like XY values? Like XY? But uh, let's get a visual going. That, that might help. Uh, you should get before, maybe we'll get here. Let's go three, six, nine. 12, right? And so this is uh, number of months and then savings in dollars. Well, at some point there was 145, at some other point there was 
200, 280, that's like almost double, 280. So at this point, this point, right? You guys see that every single month, he's saving more and more per month. And, and that's going to increase it. Um, there, there was some hint in the paragraph that made me think it was going to be a linear increase, right? that, that was going to increase the cost of rate. Right? Uh, so how much per month is he increasing? Now, doing little bits here. So every single month, throwing in. Right? So basically, what's the slope of that line? How many increased dollars per month? Right? Rise over rent. Right? So uh, the slope, let's call it M for slope, is 280 minus 145 now per month, all divided by a difference of 12 minus three. So this is over a nine month period that that increased. So what is that? So 280 minus 145, you know, I'll break it down and throw in the extra stuff here. So it's $135 increase over a change of nine months. Yeah, that's $15 increase per month. So that's the slope of that line, $15 per month that increase. Number 10. Uh, which of the following equations graphed in the XY plane will include only values of Y that are less than two? Uh, I'll walk you guys through this one. Uh, well, never mind. You, you guys go ahead. Okay, so option D, why would it have been an option D? Okay. So it has Y values that are only less than two. Okay, so I've got all four equations written out here, except for one by one, right? Oh, maybe, maybe do a quick graph on each one of these. That could probably be pretty helpful, right? See, see what a graph looks like. Like, so X squared plus three, or sorry, negative X squared plus three. Wouldn't that be like an upside down parabola bumped up three units? Right, so that'd be like this. So does that have any y values that are greater than two? Yeah, if you plug in zero for x, then it's three, right? right. Okay, so, so you see sort of the, the approach we're gonna do for this. We're gonna go through each answer choice one by one, and maybe see if we can find some kind of counter example that would make it false, right? Okay, so it can't be option A. Option B, uh, this absolute value minus one. Well, absolute value just makes it positive. So doesn't that just completely nullify this negative sign right here? Right. Absolute value, you guys know what that looks like? So one of those V-looking graphs because it's just positive values, and then shift it down one. So that's gonna look like like this. Uh, yeah, that has uh, lots of uh, y values that are greater than two, right? Like if you plug in you know, five for x, so that, that would work, right? Right. Uh, because it would make this just super positive. Right. Uh, option. Well, this option with some kind of cubic move down four. Do uh, you guys know what uh, x cubed is not going to take this general shape right here? Something kind of like that. Yeah, just plug in a thousand for x, boom, that's more than two, right? So, uh, so it's got to be this one, probably, right? Uh, what, what would this look like? Okay, so we got a parabola shifted to the right one unit, dumped upside down, and then shifted up one. Huh. So a few manipulations, but so, so upside down parabola. And yeah, I like that. Yeah, because shift the right one, shift it up one. I think it would go through the origin too, wouldn't it? Because uh, so you plug in zero, this becomes one squared, one negative. Yeah, it sure would. Yeah, so this is exactly what this looks like. Uh, oh, well, here's two, here's y equals two way up here. Is there anything two or above? No. So there's your answer right there. Okay. 
And, and then if you're trying to find counter examples, you just like plug in lots of stuff for X. Yeah, this will, the, the largest this will ever be is one, right? Grace, this can never go to zero. Otherwise it's just going to be negative. Let's go, go up to zero plus one because it's only go up to one. All right, look at it. Yeah, not that way. Number 11. Uh, oh, it's a little tricky. If f of x plus one is three x minus four, then what is the value of f of negative four? Here's a hint. What would x have to be so that all this f of something, that something x plus one is negative four, what would x itself have to be? And it's not negative four, it's what? Negative right, right? So x, I would try that, yeah. I say option A, negative 19. That is it, negative 19. Ooh, somebody got it. Somebody got it. Let's switch over and go over this one. All right, so uh, they gave you this and they said, what is F of negative four, right? Okay. Well, wouldn't you plug in negative five for X? They'd be like negative five plus one, huh? And that'd be like three times negative five, and then all minus four. So that's negative 15 minus four. Negative 19. And that was the answer. Okay. Uh, I don't remember coming across one like that last week. So yeah, it's a little bit outside the box thinking, but uh, there might be another way to solve it too. I bet you could solve that graphically just with like shifting equations around though. So different approaches to these things. All right, number 12. Uh, ooh, imaginary values. If you were to rearrange that in the form A plus BI, then what is the value of A? Remember I is the square root of negative one. Hint. Do you guys remember something about a conjugate pair? Ooh, yeah, the answer was C. Um, I, I bet a couple of guys got that right, but just forgot that uh, I swapped B and C on uh, this just to match the SAT format. But um, we'll go show you guys why. Okay. Yeah, let's do a review of, uh, of I. You guys remember I is this imaginary number? Okay. Uh, do you guys remember? Okay. Let's this up for a moment. Okay. 
that there's this four part pattern with I. I is the square root of negative one. Right? So it's like an imaginary number. Now, weirdly enough, imaginary numbers that do have like some practical use in the real world, but uh, side thought there. Uh, it, what do you get if you get I squared? Well, it'd be square root of a square of a square root. Doesn't that just bring you to negative one? Right? Which is a real number. If you have i cubed, isn't that like i squared times i? That's just like negative i. What if you have i to the four? Isn't that like i squared squared, which is like positive one? Wouldn't that be true? Okay. And this right here is your four part cycle with i's. Okay. It's i's to different powers, you can go up to four. Because once it, once you go beyond that, like i to the five, isn't that just like i to the four times i, which is like one times, like, that's just the same thing as i. Is it? And so just like cycle through. Okay, now that you guys remember that, let's see what they gave you here. They told, they told you this, right? And they said, somehow put it in the form A plus B I, right? A plus B I is, it could be a complex number. Complex meaning it might have a real portion and an imaginary, imaginary portion. Well, they gave you this crazy looking fraction. How's that gonna look like that? Uh, uh, here's where a conjugate pair comes in. You guys remember the, this, uh, this conjugate pair, right? So, a uh, conjugate pair of two minus three i would be two plus three i. And, and the reason I chose that is because that will make the denominator a real value. And then uh, I can not have imaginary numbers in the denominator. Right? Now here's where I have to FOIL, F-O-I-L. Do on top, we got 10 plus 15 i minus two i uh, minus three i squared. Does that look like that? And then FOIL out the denominator, the i's go away because F-O-I-L, the o and the i cancel because it was set up to do that. That's the purpose of the conjugate pair. Looks like that, okay. Now here's where you're gonna take advantage of this four part cycle with the i's. Three, negative three i squared, isn't that the same thing as just positive three? Right, so this would be 13 collectively right here, these two terms tied together. And then what about the denominator? Wouldn't this be four plus nine, right? Four plus nine, which is ooh, also 13. Looks like this, okay. Uh, so at some point it looks like this, 13 plus 13 i all divided by 13. The 13s all cancel and you just get one plus i. So now this is in the complex form a plus bi. They ask what is a, but huh, I guess a and b are both the same thing. They're both one, right? Yes, good. Right. So um, when you guys see complex numbers a couple of days from now, uh, probably remember a couple of things. One is this whole conjugate pair trick that I just did. Uh, you have to know some foiling. Blah, blah. Also remember, this four part uh, pattern with the eyes. Right? If you have I to the four, it just cycles back around to one. Uh, what is the sum of all p values that satisfy that equation? Oh, okay, hold on. That was too fast for me. Uh, let me pull it up on my side so I can read, read what that was. This number 12. No, that was number 13. Uh, okay, I gotta write this down. 3p squared plus 24p minus six, all equals zero. Okay, let me switch my screen over and show you guys how to solve this one. All right, so they, they said, uh, what is the sum of the p about the values that p could be? Now, right away, I see it's quadratic. So there's probably gonna be two solutions. Although it is possible there's one or zero, but there's probably gonna be two. And we'll just take those two solutions and add them together. Okay. SAT likes to do that. They say, you know, like find X and Y and then do one last little operation. Add them together, subtract them, multiply them. In this case, add them, okay. So um, I'd like to fact that this may be a big uh, but I could take a three out. You guys see how there's multiple three on all these? Not that you have to do this, but it does simplify it. If you take a three out, P squared plus eight P minus two, Right, and that be true. Now I can just play with, around with the bracket stuff, just divide the side by three. Right. Now I would want to factor this, except I'm thinking, what are two numbers that multiply to two or negative two and then add eight? Uh, I can't really think of anything. So, ah, quadratic formula. Right. You guys ready to break out the quadratic formula? Right. So in this form, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. That x, or in this case p, is equal to negative b, just like negative eight, plus or minus the square root of b squared, that's 64 minus four times a, there's an implied one here, times c, which is negative two, right? And then all divided by two a, so two times negative one, or sorry, two times one, okay? 
remember this is pre-solved whenever you have this quadratic is equal to zero, right? All right, so yeah, play around with this a little bit. Uh, negative eight over two is negative four. And I got plus or minus. Uh, 64 plus eight is like 72. <coughs> Great, 72 on two. Uh, you can't simplify this piece, but tell me there's sort of a shortcut trick to the answer right now. So P could be negative four minus this crazy fraction or negative four, four plus this crazy fraction, right? And remember what you're actually supposed to find is what is the sum of those two P values. So, hey, isn't it here? If you have negative four minus root 72 on two and negative four plus root 72 on two, add those up. Isn't the whole crazy fraction bit just going to cancel out the negative of that and the positive of that? Goodbye. The answer is negative eight. Oh, uh, you know what? Bell's about ring in a few seconds. So, we're going to have to call that a uh, wrap. Let's see who's, uh, who's heading the points race. Uh, Jules, Bridget, Mason, Luke, and Matthew. All right, nice job, guys. Uh, those were all section three questions. Tomorrow we'll do some section four questions and uh, get you guys ready for this, at least the math part, on Wednesday. All right, you guys have a good Monday.